Therefore, it's time for members' statements. The member from Thornhill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'm very pleased to rise to tell everybody that this Thursday, October 26, the women of Toronto will join together and kick off yet again the Shabbat project with the fourth annual community challah Chalabek is that breaded sweet bread that we eat on Sabbath and special holidays and the rest of the year as well. And uh, the Shabbat project is just to get Jews together to observe a little bit of. Shabbat, and this year they're also honoring Judy Feld Carr, who's a very celebrated, uh, powerful woman in the community. Who's, uh, of course, she's a mother and a wife and a teacher, but what she's really known for is secretly saving over 3,000 Syrian Jews. And the evening will feature a hands-on workshop of braiding techniques, as well as allowing participants the experience of preparing two oven-ready challah loaves from scratch. And so I'm inviting everybody to join hundreds of women and girls under one roof for an amazing evening of Jewish pride, creating unity and inspiration in the community with the poignancy of joint prayers and blessings. And it will be Toronto's biggest challah bake, and uh, everybody wants to see lots of people there. So go to ShabbatProjectToronto.com for more information. And um, I actually went to uh, a couple of these, Mr. Speaker, and I want you to just imagine a room with about a thousand women at tables, uh, making challah bread, wow. hearing from some speakers, listening to uh, Israeli music um, in a huge banquet hall. So lots of fun. Thanks a lot. That was fun. Further member statements. The member from Windsor to come see. Speaker, love for all, hatred for none. That's the motto of the Amadea Muslim Jamaat. They've been practicing their religion in Canada for 50 years, and last week they celebrated that anniversary in Windsor. I took part in a wonderful ceremony on the banks of the Detroit River. The Amadean community donated a beautiful sculpture. Picture this speaker, four arms reaching to the sky, all different colors, and the hands are holding a huge globe in which is written, love for all, hatred for none. I wish to thank the Amadean Muslim Jamaat for their excellent donation to our community. I'd like as well to send anniversary greetings to some of our Unifor locals in the Windsor area. I joined members and retirees of Local 200 yesterday as they marked their 75th years or 75 years of working in our Ford plants, and I'll celebrate with Unifor Local 240 on Friday night at the Beach Grove Golf and Curling Club. Local 1498 just celebrated their 50th anniversary, so congratulations to all of our Unifor locals. And finally, Speaker, let me say how I'm hoping we will soon see an end to the strike by faculty members at our community colleges. I spent some time last Friday on the picket lines in Windsor. This strike isn't about wages, Speaker. It hinges on job security. Members of OPSU want to see fewer part-time instructors. Another big issue is academic freedom. Instructors want to have a say in course development and how they teach the courses they design. Let's hope both sides return to the table in the next day or so. Thank you. Further member statements, the Chief Government Whip and member from St. Catharines. Each year since 1956, during the annual Grape and Wine Festival, an individual is chosen to serve as a national ambassador for Ontario's grape and wine producers, representing the industry at events across Canada. That person is known as the Grape King. Doug Whitty, owner of Whitty Farms and 13th Street Winery, was chosen as the 2017 Grape King, was honoured with this title on September 13th of this year and appropriately crowned at the 13th Street Winery, greeted by enthusiastic applause by all attendees. Doug and his family are excellent farmers and operators of the 13th Street Winery. The Whitty family farm was started by his grandfather in 2008 and is now producing 55 acres of vinifera wine grapes. And Doug is second in the family to wear the crown. His Fourth Avenue farm is the site of many community activities, including the Grape of Wrath Mud Run, supporting the Canadian Cancer Society Wheels of Hope program. As Farm Credit Canada's Trish Potter said, Doug Whitty's 13th Street operation helps elevate the entire Ontario grape and wine industry, and his farm displays exceptional quality, expertise, and leadership in the industry. To Doug and to Doug's family, many years back, and his present family, congratulations, a most appropriate choice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Perry Sound, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. I rise to share a positive 
positive story with my colleagues and caution the government about policies that hurt small business. Last month, I was pleased to visit Phoenix Building Components in Sundridge. Like their namesake, this business rose from the ashes of Kent Trusses, which shut down in August 2016 after 40 years. At its peak, Kent Trusses employed 100 people and was the largest employer in the village of Sundridge. When it closed, it threw 80 people out of work. Phoenix, Phoenix, which is based in Barrie, Ontario, started building trusses in Sundridge again in April of this year and once again employs 50 people. That may not sound like a big deal to some of my colleagues but from city ridings, but in a community of less than 1,000 people, 50 jobs makes a huge difference to the whole community. I want to thank Grant Gibbons, President and CEO of Phoenix, for his company's investments in Sundridge. When I visited Phoenix in September, it was great to see people at work and trucks delivering lumber and picking up trusses. But Andy Forsyth, operations manager, told me that between hydro rates and other government policies, it is a struggle to restart a business in Ontario right now. Communities like Sundridge need businesses like Phoenix, so I asked this government to find policies that will help businesses and small communities succeed. I've recently heard from small employers around Perry San Muskoka about proposed labour changes in Bill 148. I hope that this government will do another round of real consultation on Bill 148 and actually listen to these small employers around Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Further member statements? The member from Oshawa. October 24th is World Polio Day, and I want to highlight the vital work of Rotarians across our communities as they work to eradicate polio from the face of the earth. Polio is a crippling childhood disease that is terribly infectious and leads to paralysis and sometimes death. During the first half of the 20th century, polio crippled over half a million people every year. There is no cure, but there is a preventative vaccine for as little as 60 cents worth of vaccine. A child can be protected against this disease for life. In 1985, Rotary International and its partners launched the Global Polio Eradication Initiative, and the incidence of polio has plummeted from about 350,000 children paralyzed every year to fewer than a dozen confirmed cases so far by this year's September. Thanks in large part to Rotary International and to the 1.2 million Rotary members worldwide, including the 10 Durham Region Rotary Clubs and our two in Oshawa, polio will soon be just a memory. The world is 99.9% .9 polio free, but the fight to end polio is not over. This World Polio Day, the CN Tower in Toronto will be lit red and yellow, and across communities, Rotarians will be recognized with proclamations and events. Polio could be the first human disease of the 21st century to be eradicated because of the successful engagement of over 200 countries and 20 million volunteers. Go online to www.end polio.org to support. Thank you to the Oshawa Rotary Club and the Oshawa Parkwood Rotary Club for their work across our city. And this World Polio Day, we thank Rotary Clubs across all our communities for their ongoing service and commitment and polio in our world. Thank you. Thank you. For the member's statements, the member from Kingston in the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to talk about the Rohingya Muslims who are fleeing violence and persecution in Myanmar. Since August, more than a half million men, women and children have had to flee their homes to make the punishing journey for refuge in Bangladesh. These numbers will rise. The United Nations confirms the Rohingya are facing ethnic cleansing. Hundreds have already been murdered. And those who have been spared, including young children, have watched their villages burn to the ground. The New York Times recently described soldiers tearing babies from their mother's arms and throwing them into the fire boys being beheaded and girls being gang-raped, among many other horrors. I am proud that Canada so often calls out transgressions against humanity, and that's why I believe that we must recognize and condemn this violence. Shortly, I will be presenting a petition that calls for us to acknowledge the violence in Myanmar. I am so proud of those members of my riding of Kingston and the Islands, an effort spearheaded by Zerman Khan, who is here with us along with his family today in the gallery and putting this petition together. In closing, Mr. Speaker, we've heard these crimes be described as unimaginable, but they are imaginable and we do know they're going on. The cries of those experiencing this depraved persecution in Myanmar must not be ignored. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from 
Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is widely acknowledged that industrial wind turbine projects are an expensive and environmentally damaging way to generate electricity. I have long called for a moratorium on turbines and an end to the disastrous Green Energy Act. Yet a new project is, uh, is underway less than one kilometre from the suburban streets of Wallaceburg along the banks of Otter Creek. This project threatens some of the best agricultural land in our country, land which, after the construction of industrial turbines, will never grow food again. I am surprised that the Minister of Agriculture raises no questions. This is an environmentally sensitive area, home to 24 species at risk and within a major flight path for migratory birds. I am amazed that the Minister of Natural Resources raises no objections. The Otter Creek development will require the foundations of its enormous towers to be supported by steel pilings driven into bedrock. This bedrock includes a band of Kettle Point black shale, which carries water of the aquifer and fills the wells of my constituents. With 14 wells already rendered undrinkable in North Kent, there are legitimate concerns about this project's impact on water quality. I'm astounded that the Minister of Environment won't take these concerns seriously. Speaker, on Thursday, October 26, the newly formed Wallaceburg Area Wind Concerns Group will host a public meeting at 7 p.m. in the UAW Hall in Wallaceburg. I will be there. I invite any concerned minister of this government to join me. Thank you. Thank you. Further members' statements, the member from Ottawa South. Very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it's been about a week since we heard of the horrible attack in Mogadishu, where over 300 people died and 300 injured or more. And I know that uh, we had an opportunity earlier last week to uh, observe a moment of silence in here in the legislature, and I know that all members of the legislature stand with Ontario's and Canada's Somali community uh, in grieving and mourning and condemning this horrendous attack. I want to say a few words about uh, the Somali community uh, in my riding of Ottawa South and in Ottawa. Over the last week, it's been incredible to see how everyone has come together. Last Thursday, they held a vigil on Parliament Hill. And just recently, I was honoured and privileged to attend uh, an event, Stand with Mogadishu, uh, an evening. Uh, the theme of the event was solidarity. And, Speaker, it is really quite incredible, the, the generosity uh, and the, um, the thoughtfulness and the solidarity of the community around this really horrible incident. There are families who have family members who died and who were injured. And yesterday, uh, they were able to raise beyond their goal. This is in the community of Ottawa, $100,000. Really quite incredible. And I want to thank all the organizers, all the people who were involved, all the volunteers, all the donors who came together in less, a little bit more than a week to put this together and thank them for their commitment, not only to the broader global community, but to their own community of Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Further member statements, the member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, last week this government chose once again to use strong arm tactics and cancelled two days of scheduled public hearings for Bill 139, the Building Better Communities and Conserving Watersheds Act. After promising to keep those with concerns informed, the government went ahead and cancelled two days of hearings, effectively silencing citizens and organizations. The Lake Erie North Shore Landowners Association, for my riding, is just one of those many organizations that did not get a chance to voice their concerns. Lenslaw Lake Erie North uh, Shore Landowners Association was founded in January of 2016, and it represents landowners from Algon County and northern Lake Erie shoreline and boasts local agriculture producers, professionals, ac academics, and retirees among its membership, and has a combined property valuation of over $34 million. <laughs> Lenzla has been effective in compelling local conservation authorities, municipalities, and diverse stakeholders to examine their governance, public policy approaches, and duty to adhere to principles of public accountability. It's also unfortunate that the water resources section of the natural resources conservation policy branch was not interested in engaging this group in further serious dialogue. 
The Lake Gary North Shore Landers Association wishes to underscore that the Conservation Authorities Act must be grounded on the guiding principle of affording citizens the right to due process at all levels within governance, financing, stakeholder relations, authorities, enforcement powers with respect to provincial offences, permit processes, and the rights to administrative review and procedural fairness. Mr. Speaker, I hope this government will change its mind and reach out to these or local organizations and make the Bill 139 the best it can be for the province. Thank you very much. Thank you. I thank all members for their statements.